Loving Father in heaven, thank you that you are the author and finisher of our faith. Speak to us that we may know the blessing of being faithful. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to encourage you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, the focal scripture for the message, the perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12 verse 2 reads as follows. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. By grace and by God's work, one day we too will sit down with Jesus on his Father's throne. You know, I'd like to begin with a story that illustrates the importance and the focal point of the message. So I began to look at something that many of us have heard about but haven't taken the time to look into, the formation of diamonds. You know, diamonds are amongst the rarest of stones, largely because of what it takes to form one. Diamond formation occurs when carbon deposits deep within the earth, some say 90 to 125 miles below the surface, are subject to high temperature and pressure. Experts say that the formation process can take thousands of years of intense pressure to form a single diamond. But formation is just the beginning of the process. You see, finding a diamond and shaping it is where the value increases. I'll say that again. Finding a diamond and shaping it is where the value increases. You see, in the hand of a master craftsman, diamonds can reach astronomical prices because it is the craftsman's responsibility, it is the craftsman's touch, it is the craftsman's blade that brings out the brilliance buried within the diamond. For example, I read the story about a diamond called the Pink Star. It is known to be the largest diamond to receive a vivid pink color grade and the most expensive diamond ever sold at auction. In April 2017 at the Salisbury auction, the pink diamond, which was 59.6 carats, shaped by the craftsman's blade, sold for an astronomical $71 million. Now, while you're inhaling that number, hold on to that for a moment as I say the following. More valuable than the pink diamond is a child of God. Becoming one is just the beginning. It is the shaping process that increases our value. And in the hand of Jesus, the master craftsman, our value becomes astronomical. But the fact of the matter is we may not look like or feel like a brilliant diamond, but we have the promises that Jesus has made that our brilliance will outshine the brilliance of the best diamond when he has completed his work in us. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, we read this promise. Beloved, now we are children of God. We're not going to become, but now we are children of God. But he says, as the diamond being shaped, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But here's the promise. But we know, I say that again, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know what encourages me whenever I stumble or have a difficult day I'm always encouraged that even though I may not look like Christ yet, even though he hasn't brought out the, bre the best brilliance in me, he promises that he will finish what he has started. And that is why faith is the most essential component in the Christian's life. And you may ask, how is faith shaped? That's a word that people don't like to hear. The word is trials. You know, trials are often the blades that shape us. It cuts away our hard edges to reveal the work of the master craftsman. But the fact of the matter is, it is not our faith, but it is God's faith that sustains us until he completes his work. And from the inception to the completion, Jesus has promised to be the author and perfecter of our faith. And so in this message, in this sermon, I'm going to outline methods that Jesus uses to develop his faith in us. But before we get to the methods, I'd like to begin with some imperatives about faith. 
Let's start with the necessity of faith. In the book Habakkuk 2 and verse 4, we read this short but powerful statement, the just shall live by faith. Let me say that again. Those that are justified by the righteousness of Jesus can only live one way. The just shall live by faith. What does that mean? What that means is separated from faith, we cannot accept God's existence. Apart from faith, we cannot please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Outside of faith, we cannot claim God's promises. Without faith, we cannot embrace God's salvation. And severed from faith, which to me is very important, we cannot even live godly lives. But so many people try to live godly lives based on just their understanding of the 28 fundamentals, or whatever the fundamentals of your faith may be. So many people say, this is what I've been taught, this is what I believe, this is what I'm going to follow, and they try to do that separated, apart from, outside, without, and severed from the faith that is found in Christ. The enabling factor is the faith of Christ. And when you think about it, faith is simple and complex at the very same time. But sadly enough, faith has been redefined and diluted like many other facets of Christianity. Think about it for a moment. How many preachers have you heard? How many prosperity preachers have you heard that would say a lack of possessions has been attached to a lack of faith? They say you don't have because you don't have enough faith. You don't have this or that because you don't have enough faith. Your bank account is small because you don't have enough faith. Well, the fact of the matter is, friends, sometimes God knows that if our bank account is full, our faith would decrease because we would rely on the numbers in our account rather than the possessions of an inexhaustible God. Some also say that the absence of success has been contributed to the deficiency of faith. Well, I don't believe that either because success is not based on our faith. It's based on God's faith. And some people think that because they pray and God doesn't answer that, that means that their faith is weak. No, God knows what prayer to answer and what prayer not to answer. As Billy Graham's wife once said, she says, thank the Lord that he does not always answer our prayers because if he did, she would not have married Billy Graham. Others also say the lack of wealth has been blamed on an impotent faith. But friends, wealth is not the measure of faith because we cannot buy our way into the kingdom. We cannot get into the kingdom by purchasing a first-class ticket or a round-trip ticket or an economy or whatever the case may be. Money is not the avenue by which we're going to gain eternal life. So if somebody says your, your success or your possessions or your lack of wealth is an indication of a weak faith, tell them that it's not possession nor wealth nor success, but it is the faith of Jesus. And some of these same ministries, they talk about selling faith when in fact all they're selling is enterprise. And they say, if you give me this, then you'll gain more faith. Well, friends, the only thing that you can give is your life, your heart, your will to God, and he will and has promised to increase your faith. When you follow these false ideologies about faith, faith has been the icing on the cake. It has been boiled down to the dressing on the salad. But hear me carefully. Faith is not the icing on the cake. Faith is the cake. Faith is not the dressing on the salad. Faith is the salad itself. You see, to me, faith is like a tracking number. I ordered things from Amazon. My wife often says, what did you get next when the package shows up? But regardless of that, faith is like a tracking number. You see, when you have a tracking number, you have the evidence that something with substance is going to show up. When you know the tracking number, you can say, my package is in Chicago, my package is in New York, my package is in Maryland, it's on its way. I get excited when my package is in Marion because I know the next day it's going to be in West Frankfurt. The tracking number gives us evidence that something substantial is on its way. That's why the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence or the tracking number of things not seen. In these last days, we have to pray for God to increase our faith. But you know, friends, he promises to do that. What he has started, he is able to complete. We know that being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it, Philippians 1 verse 6. So God is able to complete whatever he starts. But it's not God that's often the problem, it is us. How much do we want to submit to the molding influence of God? How much do we want to submit to the chiseling blade 
of the master craftsman. When he sees something in us that's not like him, how many of us want to feel that blade cutting away us so that we could become more like Jesus, so that one day his brilliance and his righteousness alone will appear? That's why the words of Christ appears with great force and has a great application to the last days. You find in Luke 18, verse 8, these very short words. Jesus asked the question, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, that's a very powerful question. Because prior to the coming of Jesus, there will be a people on the earth whose faith will be established not on things, but on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith. But what has been happening in the church over the last four or five years People and even Christians have been placing their faith in the wrong avenues, in the wrong direction, some on finances, some on the stability or instability of the economy, some on presidential hopefuls or presidential candidates, some on politics and some on religion. But friends, anytime your faith is based on anything but Christ, your faith is in jeopardy. You will not be ready for the coming of Jesus. But when Jesus comes, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, tells us what kind of people Jesus is going to be returning for. We read in Revelation 14, 12, when the presentation of those who endure trial comes, when the unfallen worlds see those who have come through difficulty and hardship by the faith of Jesus, these are the words that will be proclaimed throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Notice those words, the faith of Jesus. When we think about faith, we think about, well, we think about it sometimes as effort, sometimes as gritting our teeth and hanging in there. That's not faith. That's effort. That's work. You're trying to be good based on how well you can be. But the Bible makes it very clear. We are not saved by our works. We are saved by grace through faith. And that faith is in the work of Christ and not in any work on our own. And so some people think that they have to grit their teeth and try hard and try harder. And that's why salvation is not based on T-R-Y-U-M-P-H. It's based on T-R-I-U-M-P-H, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And even those of you that are American citizens, sometimes if you misunderstand it, the Declaration of Independence could mislead you. It says the following, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now pause for a moment, the pursuit of happiness. This world does its best to try to make us happy. Just think about all the social media, all the entertainment, all the electronic devices, and sometimes being a gadgetarian, sometimes I have to pull my own coattail not to base my hope and my joys on the next device that has just been released or created. But some people try to find their hope in things that are trifling and transient and that change with the tide. One day the sun is out, they feel good. Another day the sun is not out, they feel bad because they're basing their stability and their happiness on things that will not maintain its stability. I've heard Christians say, I'm not happy. Well, the fact of the matter is, friends, God does not call us to happiness. God calls us to faithfulness. And when we are faithful, believe me, we will know what true happiness is all about. Revelation 2 and verse 10 says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. I can guarantee you when you get your crown of life, you're going to be happy. When you make it into the kingdom, you're going to be happy. When your feet touch the feet of the new Jerusalem, you are going to be happy. So don't try to find happiness in this life because it is only found in the kingdom that is eternal. Praise God for that. Psalm 144 and verse 15 says, Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And so in these last days, we have to really ask the question, where is our God? Is it in something? Is it in our house? Is it in our position of society? Is it in our bank accounts? Is it in the accoutrements surrounding us? Are we so content by the things we have that we forget that the only foundation of real happiness 
is investing our hearts and our will in the Lord. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And while you think about that, consider this. Faith is not faith in something. Faith is faith in someone. That's why Jesus illustrated the difference in the lesson of the fig tree that eventually dried up. Look at Mark chapter 11, verses 20 to 22. Now in the morning, as they passed by, that is the disciples, they saw a fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, that is to the Lord, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. And listen to the response of Jesus, which is the response that each one of us must remember in order to find true happiness and true find, in order to find true faith. Jesus said, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Notice, not faith in something, but faith in someone. You see, friends, the things that we put our faith in that are transient will wither up. The things that we put our faith in that are temporary, its roots are going to dry up. On any given day without any prior notice and for no apparent reason, you may be faced with the removal of the thing that you trusted so much in. That's why Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. Why? Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, my wife and I have been married, oh, 39 years going on, that is. 39 years of marriage, beautiful years of marriage. 35 years in ministry, and we have seen the ups and downs in our lives have often been when we put our faith in something, and then God allows trials to come along, and we restore our faith in someone. There are some of you that go through the trials of life, and why God allows the trials is to give you an opportunity to refocus from something to someone. You see, faith that is invested in things will not grow. Our faith will either decrease or increase based on how we invest it. Now, somebody might say, well, I don't really have faith. Well, that's not true. According to God's word in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, according to God's word, the Bible says, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith, kind of like this glass of water. You know, whenever I'm on the set doing Sabbath school or sometimes doing a program on 3ABN, I like to empty that glass. I drink it and then the production team, they sneaks in and fill that glass back up. When I, when I begin to consume what has been given to me, God has promises when we invest in the right things, God will replenish his store. God has given to each one of us a measure of faith. But how we invest it depends on how it will grow. And I've learned in a very real way, I've learned in a very instrumental way, in a very experiential way, that when faith endures the unknown, it will flourish and it will be strengthened. What do I mean by the unknown? You know, sometimes we say, God, increase our faith. Now, that's a dangerous prayer to pray because when you pray the prayer, God, increase our faith, you take it completely out of your hands because God decides how he's going to increase your faith. And you may not agree with the method, but the master craftsman knows exactly what knife is needed to begin to form you into a brilliant diamond of faith for his own glory. When we endure the unknown, our faith will flourish and will strengthen, but it depends on how much you trust God. A number of, a number of years ago when my wife and I drove to California for the very, very first time, oh, way back in, I think, 1984, we prayed for the Lord to get us there safely. I had an old Toyota Corona station wagon, no air conditioning. The fenders were cancer. What I mean by that is they were so rusted that whenever you drive down the road, whenever I drive down, the wind would pull me to the one side or the other side. The fenders would look like wings if you looked in your rearview mirror. But we trusted God to get us in that broken down vehicle through the hot desert with no air conditioning we trusted God to get us to the other side. And an old African-American lady said to me as we were preparing to go to California for the first time, she says, if God can get Moses through the wilderness with one slipper, God can get you to California successfully. And my wife and I held on to that. We made it that way. We drove as fast as we could. That was the only way we got air conditioner. 
And when I got to California, my left arm was peeling for weeks because it was out the window in the southern part of the state on Highway 10, and the sun was intense. But God got us there. God got us to our destination. How did he do it? There were three things that we trusted, and we relied on God supremely. But God gave us a map. God gave us signs to know as we journeyed. And God also gave us mile markers. You see, friends, God's word is the map. This is your map. When you follow the map, God promises it will get you reliably to your destination. We had signs also when we entered the state of Texas, for example. It shocked us because we decided, well, we can drive as far as we can. But when we entered the state of Texas and we saw the mile marker, 880 miles, we thought there's no way we're going to try to drive through this state in one day. So we pulled off halfway into the state. The sign told us, that this was not going to be an easy task. It was hot, we were tired, and we decided to spend the night in a motel. The next morning, we woke up all enthusiastic to continue our journey. And as I got on the freeway, I remember very well as I continued the journey, I was, it was my turn to drive. We were driving for a little while, and my wife says, Honey, 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 doesn't that look like a gas station we saw yesterday? And I said, uh, I don't think so. I think that Texas is big enough to have two gas stations that look exactly alike. And I continued driving with all the confidence that I was going in the right direction. And not too far down the road, we saw this tall green Sunoco dinosaur at a gas station. My wife said, honey, uh, John, did we see that green dinosaur yesterday? And I thought to myself, well, not even Texas is big enough to have two big, ugly green dinosaurs like that. And I took the time to look down at the signs on the roadway, and I realized I was on my way back to Florida rather than on my way to California. The good news, friends, is I started noticing things that I'd already passed by, indicating I was going in the wrong direction. What's the lesson that I learned? You see, when the things that God has already bought you past begin to appear in your life again, your life is going in the wrong direction. That's why God gives us his word. So what did I do? Well, <laughs> you know, my wife didn't forget that for a while. She reminded me a number of miles that, see, I told you you were going in the wrong direction, and sheepishly I had to endure it, but the good news is we made our destination to California. What's the message there? You see, the question is, the mile marker showed me the mile markers were increasing. The highway sign, say, going east, was there for me to indicate that I was going in the wrong direction. So I have to ask you the question, what are the mile markers of your faith? How can you measure the distance between your faith growing or your faith decreasing? How can you know whether or not your faith is moving in the right direction? Well, you got to pray the prayer that Dr. Luke records in Luke chapter 17 and verse 5. You see, when the apostles did not have enough faith, they prayed this very sincere prayer. And here it is. They said, Lord, increase our faith. Lord, increase our faith. Now, let me just caution you. When you pray, Lord, increase our faith, buckle your seatbelts because God is going to take you through what he knows is needed to refine your faith and to bring out your brilliance. Consider the stories that you know, the Hebrews in the fire. Now, the Hebrews probably would have said, I would prefer not to be in the fire, but it was in the fire that the faithfulness of God was revealed. Daniel in the lion's den. I'm sure that Daniel would have said, I would love not to be in the lion's den, but it was in the lion's den that the faithfulness of God was revealed. It was in the fire that the brilliance of the faith of the Hebrews was displayed. Why? Because God was in the fire with them. It was the lion's den. Daniel spent a night in the lion's den Hilton Hotel, and he came out without a scratch. Why? Because God allows us to be where we need to be to strengthen our faith. When I thought about the Hebrews, something came to me. You see, the fire was Nebuchadnezzar's decision, but the, the, the furnace was Nebuchadnezzar's decision, but the fire was God's permission. I'll say that again. The furnace was Nebuchadnezzar's decision, but the fire was God's permission. God knows what is needed. God knows where we need to be in order for our faith to shine to the brilliance of his glory. 
But what about the fire? What about the furnace? You see, sometimes God uses other individuals. Sometimes God uses the instruments of another person to appear to be the test of your life. It was Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. And so, my friends, whatever God decides to use to test your faith, don't blame God for it because he wants to see if you are willing to allow him to display your obedience, not in the absence of the furnace, but in the midst of the furnace. So the instrument is up to God to allow, but the deliverance will always be God's. You see, when you study the Bible, you find that Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. But James is the faith book. When you want to find out about faith, read the book of James. All five chapters are based on the topic of faith, which brings me to my first major point. To develop the Christian, faith must be tested. Let's look at James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. To develop the Christian, faith must be tested. James says in James 1, verse 2 and 3, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I'm on my way, but I've not stopped rejoicing when trials come. But I'm beginning to understand that if God allows it, God can sustain us through it. And here's the reason, verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. What is God saying? If your faith is not tested, your patience is not developed. God will allow the testing of your faith to bring about something that you don't necessarily have, and that's patience. And he uses various trials. Listen to this quotation from the servant of God in the book Councils for the Church, page 52 and paragraph 1. Ellen White says, It requires the testing time to reveal the pure gold of love and faith in the character. When trials and perplexities come upon us, upon the church, then the steadfast zeal and warm affections of Christ's true followers are developed. I'll say that again. When trials and perplexities come upon the church, it is then that the steadfast zeal and warm affections of Christ's true followers are developed. When perplexities come, who wants perplexities? But it is through perplexities that the steadfast zeal and the warm affections of Christ's true followers are developed. If you want the Lord to be the perfecter of your faith, you can't tell him how to perfect that. You got to trust him. That's why the apostle Peter, knowing from firsthand experience what it took to get his faith strong, writes these words to us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. He says, Beloved, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Notice that's a word of certainty. As though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, there's that word again, James used it and Peter used it. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Wow. You see, God will not allow the pressures of trial to destroy our faith, but he permits the pressures of trials to bring out our brilliance, to develop our faith. So when the trial comes, when the various trials, when the fiery trials come, what is God saying to you? This is a moment to rejoice, not a moment to doubt, not a moment to say God has left me, not a moment to feel that he has abandoned his children. He has not abandoned his children any more than he did not abandon his son on the cross. But he wants to reveal to us an exceeding joy that requires the development you see, friends, you'll never be stronger than you are until you endure trials that are greater than you are. You'll never be stronger than you are until you endure trials greater than you are because it is in great trials that the perfecter of our faith, Jesus, is revealed. That's why I often say an untested faith results in immature Christianity. Some people are never growing because they don't want their faith to be tested, so they avoid every trial that God brings their way and what does God do? He brings that trial back around full circle until he allows what they try to avoid to develop their faith. God will bring another furnace your way. God will bring another lion's den your way. If you try to avoid the chastening of the Father that loves you, 
because He wants to perfect your faith, He'll bring that same trial full circle until He wants you and help you to understand, to learn the lesson. You see, it's not the fire that's going to consume you, but the fire that's going to develop the fact that you trust God in the fire. Some people will never join God in the fire. And some people God does not allow to be in the fire because He can't trust them in the fire. Fire requires two things. You trusting God and God trusting you. You see, the Hebrews were in the fire because God trusted them and they trusted God. You see, friends, you'll never be stronger than you are until you endure trials that are greater than you are. And untested faith results in immature Christianity, which takes me to my second point. Faith obeys the word. Faith obeys the word. You see, obedience to God's word is as important as breathing is to the body. Without the exercise of either, we will die. Without the exercise of faith, we will die. Without, without the exercise of what God's word says to us, we will die. But make it very clear. It is not the hearing of the word alone. Hearing the word alone does not produce faith. You could listen to and read and teach and study the Bible and still fall short of having a living faith. Well, the question is, how does our faith increase? Romans 10, verse 17, we are told in the word of God, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How would you know whether or not your faith is increasing? It's, just, it's very simple. The math is simple. The more you spend time in God's word and say, Lord, lead me in the path of your word, the more your faith will be increased because it is impossible to study God's word and not have your faith increase. It is impossible to eat spiritual bread and not gain spiritual muscle. That's why James in the faith chapter once again says in James 1 verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Recently, I decided as I'm getting older, I got to tone up these muscles. And so we in our house is being refurbished right now. So I decided, well, I'm not at home right now, so I need to do something to develop these muscles so that as I get older, they won't let me down. You know, when the pains begin to show up, you blame it on everything else other than being out of shape. So I decided we have this total gym that we bought about, oh, easily 15 years ago. And we cart that thing from one house to the next. Here's the lesson. You see, friends, weights don't put weight on you. You got to use them. You can have all the exercise machines in the world, but if you don't use them, you get no benefit. So I decided recently, my wife came home and she saw the machine set up in the, in the, um, in the living room. And, and she says, uh, why do you have the machine set up? I said, you know what? I want to get these abdomen, I want to get this abdomen tight. I don't want to be a flabby old man. I want to maintain some of the vitality that age takes away from you. I want to strengthen these arms and work on that back and make sure my leg muscles are strong. So I decided you can buy the best exercise machine, but if you don't use it, your body will never benefit. You can have more translations of the Bible than anyone else, but if you don't read it and follow it, and you are only hearers of the word, you'll deceive yourself. I can have a multi-million dollar set of weights and end up dying as flabby as a piece of paper blowing in the wind. Why? Because I don't exercise my faith. Which brings me to my third point. How do you know your faith is being exercised? Well, a number of ways. But one of the ones that I think are very instrumental in these last days is faith removes partiality. What? Faith removes partiality. This has been a concern to me as I've seen what's been happening to the Christian church. Politics has allowed the church to become a place, a place of partiality, the right against the left, the blue states against the red states, and it has infiltrated the church to begin to chisel away at the unity that God intends for each one of us to have. And we have become a place of partiality. I don't like you anymore because you don't believe what I believe politically. Brothers and sisters, don't allow politics to separate you from the mission of Christ. When we are faithful, faith removes partiality. Notice Acts 17, verse 26. The Bible says, speaking of the Christian, speaking of our Lord, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. My wife and I have traveled to more than 60 countries. It's always exciting when we go to another country. And even though the Sabbath school lesson will be in a foreign language, we know we're reading the same lesson. 
We're, we're, we're singing the same songs. It may sound like it's a different language, but the tune is the same. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. In whatever language is, the tune is the same. You see, what is God saying? The Christian church should be a place of impartiality. God shapes us. And when we are being shaped by God, the indication that we are being molded and chiseled into the brilliance of God's faith is that we will not be a people of partiality. We will exercise impartiality only on things that are not good for us. But we will not allow this partiality to separate us as brothers and sisters. James chapter 2, verse 1 to 4 reads as follows. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and you say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality? among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Do not allow partiality to rule in your life as a Christian. We must always be impartial. Treat everyone accordingly. Do not allow race or skin color or country of origin or class or social status or wealth to determine the value of others. Because when we are children of God, each one of us, I'll say that again, each one of us is on the table of the master craftsman. And if there's something about someone in your church you don't like, give God time to take his knife of faith and begin to cut off the avenues of that person's rough edges that one day will no longer appear. But it's not your concern how God cuts off their rough edges. It's your concern how God deals with your rough edges. God wants us to be a people of impartiality. Love everyone as Christ loves everyone. Which brings me to my fourth point. Faith requires Christian service. As a pastor, this one always boggles my mind. You know, we always pray when the time comes to select new officers for the year and people to operate in different facets of the church. And there's sometimes I've had people that have served one year in church or two years in church, and they'll say to me, well, pastor, I'm going to relax for the next two years. And I wondered to myself, what kind of Christian decides to relax when we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works? There is no relaxation in the Christian uh, industry. We are all workers in the field with Christ. We are there to work with him to lead others to know his saving grace. Faith requires Christian service. And an active Christian will never develop the measure of faith that they have been given. You see, the only people exempt from working for God, are you ready for it? Are dead people. Did you hear me right? The only people exempt from working for God in some capacity are dead people. That's why James, once again, the faith book says in James 2 and verse 14, he says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? The answer is simply no. That's why James 2, 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The Bible says, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Let me make it very clear. We're not saved by works. We are saved for works. We like Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, but many of us shy away from Ephesians 2, verse 10, which says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. God has a purpose for us. He has a company that he wants to hire us to be a part of. And every one of us is either working with him or working against him. That's why it's so cheap to say we love you, Lord. It means absolutely nothing unless your love for Christ activates you to do what he told Peter to do. If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my lambs. But here's a very powerful point that I want to illustrate. Not working with Jesus places us in an adversarial position. That's a big word, adversarial position. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that simply is Matthew 12 and verse 30. The Bible says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. 
See, friends, you are either working with the Lord to bring people into the garner, to bring people into the kingdom, to help others develop their faith, or you are working against him. But some people say it's so difficult to work for Christ. You hear, friends, Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according as his work shall be. That work is not a work that saves you. That work is a work that reveals the evidence of the fabric of your salvation. If you really are saved, the work that you do for the cause of Christ will reveal that you are connected to the master craftsman as he shapes you to be brilliant in his kingdom. But in order to have a living faith, the works of our hands must be in harmony with the profession of our lives. What we say and what we do must be on the same page. Listen to this, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 144 and 145. Hear the words that we read from inspiration. We are told we need the faith of Abraham in our churches today to lighten the darkness that gathers around them, shutting out the sweet sunlight of God's love and dwarfing spiritual growth. You see, when there's a light in the church, spiritual growth is not dwarfed. Ellen White continues, Age, let me say that again, age will never excuse us from obeying God. Our faith should be prolific of good works, for faith without works is dead. Every duty performed, every sacrifice made in the name of Jesus brings an exceeding great reward. Don't ever believe that what you're doing is of no value. In the very act of duty, God speaks and gives his blessing. But he requires us, he requires of us an entire surrender of the faculties, our minds, our feet, our hands, our voice. Don't use the gifts God has given to you to rob God of his glory. Don't use the gifts to bring glory to yourself. They are all for the purpose of bringing glory to God. And Ellen White ends by saying, the mind and heart, the whole being must be given to him or we fall short of becoming true Christians. Wow, that's deep. What in essence are we being told? In other words, either we are working with God to bring others to the knowledge of his saving grace or we're working against him to shut away from others the knowledge of his saving grace. He doesn't say, just give me a part of your life. She says, the heart and mind, the whole being must be given to him or we fall short of becoming true Christians. So as I began with the imperatives of faith, let me ask the question again, what is faith? If it is not living faith, it is really not faith. You see, tested faith, obedient faith, impartial faith, working faith, speaking faith, we will endure, we will be obedient. We will love everyone, not because they're lovable, but because Christ is revealing himself through us. We will work and speak kindly of others as Jesus did. Why? Because who we become is not our concern. We are in the hand like the pink diamond of the master craftsman, and he's cutting away everything that does not resemble his character. Now think about that for a moment. There's some precious pieces of diamond being cut away. Somebody might say, that's a large piece of diamond cut away. Well, let me make a very important point. The master craftsman doesn't throw any pieces of the diamonds away, but he knows what shape he wants your life to be in. He knows exactly what plan he has for you, how he wants your life to appear. So he'll cut off anything that he has not envisioned to be a part of the development of your character. That's why I began with the necessity of faith, but I end with the empowerment of faith. The necessity of faith, the just shall live by faith. And the Bible gives some beautiful examples of those that have been empowered by faith, those whose lives have been changed in the crucible of the most difficult times in human history. They are now members of the hall of faith in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. You see, faith has an impeccable history. 
For the Bible says, by faith, Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. What did Abel do? Abel gave God what God required, not what Abel desired. Cain gave God what he thought God wanted. He gave God what he preferred when Abel gave God what God required. Also, Enoch was taken to heaven so that by faith he did not see death. What kind of life did Enoch live? Enoch lived a life to ensure evil. Enoch was a man that did not allow the world around him to become the world inside of him. It was his developing faith that qualified him by the work that God did in him to get him to the kingdom before any one of us. You also find Noah built an ark. He built an ark not because he had evidence of rain coming. He built an ark simply because God said so. How could God perfect our faith unless we do what God says to do because he says so? Like little children, we say, why should we do that? Because God said so. Why should we follow God's word? Because God said so. That's the authority that we need. If God says it, that should settle the issue. Noah built that ark not because rain had ever come, but because God said so. That's real faith. What about Abraham and Sarah? My wife often qualifies ourselves as Abraham and Sarah. Why? Because when we began our ministry back in 1987, we followed God like Abraham and Sarah, not knowing where we were going. But look at us 35 years later. God is a faithful God. You see, you don't have to understand God's itinerary. You just got to get in God's vehicle, the faith vehicle, and God will make all the turns. Don't make God your co-pilot. Make God the pilot of your life. He can avoid the twists and turns of life. He can avoid the potholes of disappointment. He can avoid avoid those turbulent layers of life. Make God the pilot of your life like Abraham and Sarah, like Pastor John and his wife Angela, and God can take you farther than your eyes can ever see. What else has faith accomplished? By faith, the walls of Jericho came down after being encircled for seven days. Why did they walk around the walls for seven days? Why would they march around walls that were impregnable to the eyes of humanity for seven days? Because God said to do it. Why would Naaman go down in the water seven times? Because God said to do it. You see, that's the kind of faith that it takes for your faith to be perfected. Do it because God said it, not because it's convenient. Kingdoms are brought down. God shut the mouths of lions by faith. The ears of the deaf were open. The legs of the cripple were restored. People faced unknown hardship, not because they desired, but because, and I say it again, they were in the hand of the master craftsman, and he understood his plan for their lives. So we look back on the faithful and we say, wait a minute. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, others were rejected, tortured, stoned, mocked, imprisoned, afflicted, and willing to give their lives for a God that they had not even seen. And Hebrews 11, verse 39 and 40 says, and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. Oh, friends, but God says in verse 40 to us, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. What happened? By faith, they looked beyond the moment for the joy that was set before them, just like Jesus. You see, the cross was a station in his journey, not his final destination. His final destination was the right hand of the Father. He went there to prepare a place for you and me, but the cross was a stop along the way. But why did he endure the cross? For the joy that was set before him, You want to understand the plan of the perfecter of your faith? There's a joy set before you. Don't get caught up in the here and now, the trials, the perplexities, the difficulties of life. There's a a joy that is set before us. These all died in faith, not having received the promise. But along with those who are raised in Christ, we are going to be caught up together with the faithful to receive the promise of the master craftsman who is perfecting our faith. You see, friends, by faith, they had their minds set far above the horizon of this world. They looked beyond this time. And like Abraham in Hebrews 11, verse 12, they waited for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. That's my plan. I pray that that is your plan. So when I read the resume of the faithful, I ask the question, what made them so different? What did they have? What pushed them to do what they did? What led them to give what they gave and become what they became? They were willing to lay aside anything that prevented God from bringing out their brilliance, shaping them and perfecting them. 
So you see, in the process of being perfected, friends, there's something that God promises to do, but there's something that we must do. Listen to this, Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. we got to lay some things down. We can't just run the race. we got to lay down those things that encumber the work of the master craftsman. But then we have to fix our eyes, looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What is the message? Jesus is shaping us to bring out our brilliance. He has promised that when he is done, his faith will be perfected and we will shine to his glory. I don't want to be a diamond. I want to be a jewel in the kingdom of God. Malachi 3, verse 17, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. So my prayer for you is that you trust God. He will finish what he has started. That's why this camp meeting has been so significant. We have seen God on many levels. And our prayer to you is that every sermon you've heard, every song that has been sung, every Sabbath school lesson that you've heard, every presenter, every singer, we pray that we have done our part in encouraging you that 3ABN is committed to the perfecter of our faith. And this camp meeting has brought to the forefront why you need to be committed. Friends, Jesus will finish what he has started. My appeal to you is trust him. And when you trust him one day, your faith will be so beautiful that the brilliance of the faith of Christ will shine through your life. God bless you and thank you for joining us for Camp Meeting 2022.